Living Seed Media brings to you God's Word, which is His comprehensive equipment for changing lives. May the Lord impact your heart as you encounter His Word. For further inquiry or counsel, contact Peace House, PO Box 971, Boko, Benue State, Nigeria. Telephone numbers 0703 0363659 Email address lsmedia at livingseed.org or visit our website at www.livingseed.org Let us sit back and listen as the servant of God brings forth the word of life. Let us pray together. Our Father, we thank you so much for your presence in our midst. We thank you much more, O oh Lord, for your purpose for gathering us, for coming unto us. We believe that you have come, O oh Lord, to kindle us to indeed make us agents of transformation. Our Father, you have had a definite process of doing it. You've done it before. Wanting to do it again, you're holding on to us how you took through those who went before us. Our Father, we desire that as you come to us in this study, achieve one thing. Transform us to become agents of transformation. Help us not to ignore the method you used. Help us to locate what made those men very effective in being used in your hands. Help that we ourselves, as we discover it again, or are reminded of it, that, Lord, we will be as earnest as we, they were. Help us beyond ourselves. For in Jesus' name we are prayed. Amen. In this MLR, as we've been brought of the Lord to look at the agents of transformation, we discover that Jesus raised agents of transformation. here on earth when he was here on earth. Indeed, they transformed their age. They transformed their world. The agents of transformation that he raised being his disciples. This, in this Bible study, we desire to look at the aspect of their own lives that made them to be very effective in transforming their generation. So as I go through the introduction, and as we look at what was it that the Lord produced in their lives? What was it that was in their own lives? What was it that we can locate in their own lives that made them very effective agents of transformation? 
We've been looking at the devotions of a disciple. We are planning it immediately to ourselves because we know that it's an express way that God used in transforming the age before us. And we as well, because we must be transforming agents, God is leading very clearly before us that which will make us very, very effective. I just read through the introduction very quickly as we will look at the part of the study today. We are going to take this in three sessions. We are trusting the Lord to help us to cover the study because we tailored it for to be able to cover it uh, in this meeting. Praying the Lord to impact our lives as we read one scripture to the other. A costly glance at the scripture and the history of the church will reveal that very great result attended the labors of our elders such that the Bible records and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of Jesus, of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitude both of men and women. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of priests were obedient to the faith. That record is Acts chapter 4 verse 33, and Acts chapter 5 verse 14, even in Acts chapter 6 and verse 7, you will see the Bible bearing this record. There is also no doubt that this remarkable result was the handiwork of God. But as in every great revival or divine visitation, there is that which God alone does, which no man can contribute, and then a complementary responsibility which God expects those that belong to him to bear alongside. A thorough study of the Bible reveals that behind the great acts of the apostle lie some definite devotions which serve as the key into the revival that occurred during their time. These things are written for our learning. And we see God counting on us, sorry, as we see God counting on us to be a like responsibility in our time, we shall carefully consider their own devotions and see what lessons lie therein for us. Hence, in this study, we shall consider their devotions as the key instruments that brought revival onto the land which made men to cry everywhere. They who turned the world upside down have come hither also. We also want to look at the lessons that lie therein for us who have received the same mandate to possess our nations for God. Amen. We want to study very carefully as the Lord will help us. And I will say beyond here for you to look at it again and again in very great details. What is this complementary responsibility which God expects of us? He is out already to do a great work. He has come to us to say it is going to make us 
instrument, threshing instrument with teeth. And he said, we shouldn't fear. He's already committed to doing it. But as we saw with those who went before us, there is a responsibility that God expects us to bear. It is that responsibility. It is the devotion that we needed to give to what God is saying that we are out to study today. So we believe the Lord that as we go through looking at the devotions of those who went before us where we pick lessons, live lessons that will become our living henceforth in the name of Jesus. We will look first of all at devotions. What is a devotion? It is a Bible study, so we will be reading our Bibles. Whatever scripture we are to read, I will want you to turn to it as a person praying the Lord to reveal to you as a, an individual what he is saying to you and saying to the meeting. The book of Acts, we may not be able to read every scripture that is put in there because of our time. But permit me to ask you to please look at the book of Acts, chapter 2, and we'll be reading together verse 42 and 43. And um, do we have an extra mic? Can we have an extra mic? Because we will be, will be helping read, will be helping me to read from the congregation also. It is a study. Yes. Someone should take the mic to be able to read the book of Ruth chapter 1. Verse 16 and 18, as we look at what is a devotion. Let me read from verse 42 of Acts chapter 2, reading 42 and 43. I read it in King James Version. And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrines and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. Can somebody, the person with Ruth chapter 1 verse 16 to 18 please read for us very quickly. Praise the Lord. We are looking at the scriptures that spell out what devotion is. We have read the examples of two groups, two persons. One in the Old Testament and the other in the New and we particularly want to look at these examples, these uh, uh, records, because they spare to us what devotion is. We are talking of the disciples. And the Bible says they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrines and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayer they continued steadfastly two words that are used there continued give us an idea of not breaking of being at it of 
never stopping and the word steadfastly also brings us an idea that whatever was the obstacle whatever was the discouragement they never gave up so we are looking at devotion and we saw that in the book of Ruth also the sister decided and said wherever you go I will go but the verse that I wanted us to note particularly was that when Naomi saw that she would steadfastly follow nothing will, be dis nothing will discourage us from following the Bible said she allowed her she allowed her what therefore is devotion we are seeing that devotion is love the dictionary uh, uh, the dictionary definition devotion is love devotion is care and support for somebody or something it is the action of spending a lot of time or energy on something devotion is giving oneself giving one's time giving one affection giving one's resources entirely to a cause or to a person my personal challenge with the issue of devotion was one day and what fastened this matter to my own heart so much I just want to give you that very short testimony it has, the picture has never left me and as we are reading on what made the disciples very very effective because the Bible says as they continue steadfastly in the apostles doctrines as they gave all their time and money and, and love to the apostles doctrines to fellowship to breaking of bread and in prayers and if we read another verse there the Bible says and every day these people gathered for this seven days in a week every day they were gathering four weeks in a month they were gathering for this twelve months in a year the disciples gathered together and studied and had fellowship and broke bread and prayed that was great devotion great giving of themselves to this cause but I said the result came that they and fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles see how this followed immediately from their own devotion but I was saying one impression that happened to me of what devotion is came from an example that was not so much in scriptures a sister got converted and I went as it were to follow up she was the wife of of my boss I went to the house I went very carefully because that man was my boss and as I entered he was sitting there so you know how carefully I walked into that, that uh, sitting room and then the sister came to greet me 
and decided because the husband just took an excuse and left and left she was it he was going out and she decided that while she was doing something in the kitchen briefly she will sleep in a, a, a video perhaps to keep me busy while she was away and being the preacher being the pastor that I knew I was to her I imagined that what she was going to put for me to, to keep me busy was something Christian but then suddenly on the screen I saw a wrestler and it just came to the, to the screen and you know how they come and this man he had a very large chest he has developed muscles in the hand his middle was as tiny and his you know the muscles of the leg so developed and he was he was shouting how he will kill his his opponent he said I am going to squeeze you I'm going to strangulate you ah at first I said what is this sister doing to me then suddenly God spoke because as he spoke he said how many hours he trains in a day how long he has stayed in the gym he was talking of training for 16 hours a day he was talking of how much he has put in and when I saw the muscles that were developed God asked me did this man was this man born like this with a large chest with hands that were, were looking like the lions a physique that was was that of a lion was he born like this and I say no and I heard that man boasting of how long he had been training I now saw that it was the training and how long he has kept at it that developed those Moses you know what God asked me so will you develop spiritual Moses there is no any other way are you with me I wanted us to look at devotions I wanted us to check to see that if this man if the disciples did what God did with them and God is saying there is a complimentary responsibility and as we study them what we will see much more in their lives were the devotions that they gave to whatever be the command of the Lord over their lives I felt that each and every one of us as the Bible is saying if we will develop spiritual Moses if God will use us if we can stand boldly before the enemy and if we will have confidence for God to do what he wants to do in our generation there can't be any other method praise the Lord I just wanted us to note that the scriptures that we have read they showed us what God used the devotions of the early church to achieve what we have read we want to examine the devotions of the men that have gone before us but you know sincerely speaking let me add that we stand in danger of 
even though God be mobilized to help us, we stand in danger that we will either prolong the visitation of God or we may lose it completely. Something has been challenging my heart. Something has been nagging on my own heart. The fear that if God does not help us to pay attention to what He is saying to us in this meeting and what is bringing out in this study for us, if we pay lip service to it, I don't know. I don't know. This generation of ours may, may not have what God is saying. There is an example in scripture I just wanted to point out quickly. I'm pointing out this because I'm praying that the issue of discipleship of devotion will become so central in our heart that as we live here, we live here. Our lifestyle will be nothing else than what the early disciples did. That scripture is not in our study, but I want us to look at 2 Kings chapter 3. We will read some very few verses there, and I just bring out a very quick issue that is making my heart afraid. So when the Lord said yesterday, fear not, I say I will not fear. Praise the Lord. But the issue of devotions, as God is bringing to us, can you, can you check Second Kings chapter 3 very quickly? Very quickly. I want to read verse 16, then I will read verse 26 and 27, and then verse 16, the Bible says, and he said, that is the prophet, thus says the Lord, make this valley full of ditches, for thus says the Lord, ye shall not see wind, Neither shall you see rain, yet that valley shall be filled with water, that he may drink both ye and your cattle and your beasts. That was the, pro the prophecy that God gave. And God has repeatedly said that prophecy in our midst. The Bible says when that prophecy came, the Israelites started realizing it immediately. Look at verse 22. And they rose early in the morning, and the sun shone upon the water, and the Moabites saw the water on the other side as red as blood. And they said, This is blood. The kings are surely slain, and they are smitten one another. Now therefore Moab to the spoil. And when they came to the camp of Israel, the Israel rose up, they smote the Moabites, they destroyed all the, the fields, they, they, they fell all the tree, they went forward smiting the Moabites even to their country. They beat down every city, they conquered almost everywhere. Look at verse 26 now. And when the king of Moab saw that the battle was too sore for him, he took with him 700 men that drew sword to break through even unto the king of Edom, but they could not. Then he took his eldest son that should have reigned in his stead and offered him for a burnt offering upon the wall. The Bible says, and there was great ignition against Israel, and they departed from him and returned to their land. I just wanted us to see very 
very, very quickly. If what God is saying to us does not become our own personal devotion, the devotion that we are seeing in the world will cancel out. In fact, the devotion in the other camp is so much that if we don't stand and practice what God is saying, the revival we are talking about may be delayed. God gave this as a prophecy to the people of Israel. And we saw that immediately it began to happen. The prophecy was being realized. And as God is speaking to us and we see God moving uh, progressively with us, we see what He's doing with our lives. But look, the Bible says, as the people were smiting the Moabites, as they were killing and destroying everything, <coughs> and everything had almost finished, the last city was to be taken. And something happened. Something that when I read, I was confused. I said, what was this? But today, and subsequently, I saw that it was the issue of devotion. The king of Moab, when he saw that everything was lost, the Bible says he took his elder son, the boy that would have reigned in his stead if he died. And you will appreciate what that man did. Because I know that if this country is being attacked, you will agree that the first family that will be flown out of the country will it not be the family of the president. But then this man kept his family in the, in the country. And when everything was almost lost, he took one of his, his uh, no, he took the elder son. And the Bible says he offered him publicly on the, on the wall. And everybody saw it. What was it that beat my imagination? The Bible says when that happened, great indignation came against Israel. And they returned to their nation. They returned. Something drove them away. Something just, the battle just turned. And Israel lost that battle. Now I wonder, what made Israel to lose a battle that came by prophecy and was being actualized? And finally they would not they would not take Moab because the king, the king, showed the devotion, showed the discipline, not to God, but to, the, to their idol, that I felt God was wondering. I felt God was imagining. God himself was saying, ah, look at the ones I'm giving them victory. Look at the ones I am backing them. If I should ask any of them for their own son like this, will they do it? And as God turned his face to watch the devotion of that king and his back was torn on Israel, let me tell you, whenever God's back is torn on someone, even the Lord Jesus, you know that it was only the cry. He said, my, my, my Lord, my Lord, my father, my father, why? Why have you forsaken me? God was admiring the devotion of, of the unbelieving. If I became, I became cold. But I saw that it was scriptural because the Bible said the children of this, of, of this world, they are wiser. They are wiser than us. Look at the devotion that that man showed. And everything done against Israel. Now, as we look in our time, 
Are we not seeing the same kind of devotions? Those of us that are very, are very, um, are, are watching all the things on the cable. Do you see the devotions of unbelievers? But do you particularly see the devotion of Muslims? Are you with me? Do you see young people tie bomb on their own body? And they know that as I'm going, I'm going to explode and I will die. Are they doing it for God? Eh? Are they doing it for the Lord Jesus? They are doing it for their own, own for their own God. They are doing it for, for, for Islam. But see how completely these people have decided that we will die. Let me ask you. Do you know that if God will not find an opposite and more devoted lives in our own, our own in, 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 with us, do you know that we also stand in danger of losing what God is saying? I want to pray that the good Lord he will help us. Praise the Lord. Let me just drum this home. I read at one point what a, a communist editor said. A communist editor confessed. He said the gospel is a much more powerful weapon for the renovation of society than the Marxist theory. But you know, that man said, yet it is we that shall win, that shall conquer you. He was addressing the Christian. He said, it is we that will conquer you in the end. We communists, we do not play with words. We are realists. And because we are determined to reach our end, we also know how to provide necessary means. Speaking of sacrifice, he said, of our salaries and wages, we keep only what is absolutely necessary, and the rest we give for propaganda. To this same propaganda, we also devote all our leisure time and our holidays. And he turned to the Christian and said, You, however, give only a little time and scarcely money, any money for the spreading of the gospel. The angry, the angry editors, they sneered. How can anyone believe in the all-surpassing value of this gospel? If you do not practice it, if you do not spread it, if you do not sacrifice neither your time nor your money for that. Believe me, he said, it is we that shall conquer. Because we believe in our communist gospel and we are willing to sacrifice everything for it. We thank God that communist, communism has failed. Praise the Lord. But do you see how much they spread? Because they gave everything to it. If we will succeed, if we will bring revival, I want to say there is this aspect that we must study very, very carefully and it must become our life as we go forth from here. We want therefore to examine what were they, what did the disciples devote themselves to so much that it pleased the Lord to show himself mighty 
in their midst. The same that if we do, the presence of the Lord in our midst will burst forth and God will find channels to flow to the nations. We will study, we will start studying what they devoted themselves to. Um, today, trusting the Lord that however small we push, we will continue tomorrow. The disciples' devotions. We are in section B now. We will see that they devoted themselves unto the Lord. We will read together Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. Verse 28 to 31. We will read Acts chapter 4, verse 19 to 20. I will ask you to skip chapter 20, 19 to 25. We would have read it, but for the time. But we will read the Acts chapter 21 and verse 13. Let me read Mark chapter 10 from here. And then two other persons you will help us to read Acts chapter 4, 19 and 20 and then Acts chapter 21 and verse 13. Acts chapter, sorry, Mark chapter 10 verse 28 to 30 says, Then Peter began to say unto him, Lord, we have left all and followed thee. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that have left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or life, or children, or lands, for my sake and the gospels. But he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time, houses, and brethren, and sisters, and mothers, and children, and lands, with persecution in the world to come. And sorry, and in the world to come, eternal life. But many that are first shall be last, and the last first. Who is reading for us chapter 4 of Acts, verse 19 and 20? Please, it's only when you have a mic that you will read so that all of us will hear what you are reading. The person with the mic. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Acts 4.19 Acts 4.19 to 20 The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. Oh, sorry. Uh, Acts 4. I'm sorry. <laughs> Acts 4.19. Yeah. Acts 4.19 says, but Peter, but Peter and John replied, Judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. Acts chapter 21 and verse 13. Then Paul answered, What are you doing weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Is it too well? Praise the Lord. 
we want to look at what it means to devote one's life to the Lord from the scriptures we have read we will be discovering what it practically means to devote oneself to the Lord if we say we are devoted to the Lord how shall we ourselves know those who see us those who interact with us those among whom we work and walk how will they know first and foremost I want us to see that it's a very very personal decision the decision each and every one of us we need to take as we go along with the Lord and once the decision is taken to devote oneself to the Lord because we saw men who went before us disciples who went before us they took that decision and they seal it with their actions we are seeing Paul answering. He said, What mean ye to break my own heart? For I am ready. For I am ready. He had readied himself. He had taken that decision. He had made up his mind. Now look, my own self, my own life is to be given completely to the Lord. And that even if it means to die for the Lord, I am very ready. When, once he made up that mind, once he made up the mind, challenges came. Things happened to him. That he would have turned and, and, and given up. But we see him saying. And you know it was even brethren that were crying around him. You see at one instant. Brother Paul. There was a prophecy that came. And the man took his own giddle and tied it around himself and said, Look, this man, the man whose giddle I am, I am tying around myself, when he gets to Jerusalem, is going to suffer many things. They are going to beat him up. They are going to, they are going, he's going to suffer several things in the hands of, of the Jews. And when the brethren heard it, the brethren stood around him and they were crying, they were begging him. And we know that prophecy came by the Holy Spirit. The man who gave that prophecy was an accomplished prophet. He had prophesied earlier and it happened and there were records. And Propon knew that this is the Spirit that is speaking and the brethren knew sincerely speaking when they began to persuade Paul the man said what do you mean to break my own heart you are talking of suffering I have taken a decision that proceeds suffering that goes beyond suffering for I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name, for the name of the Lord. I'm not just ready to suffer. I'm ready to die. Now, if a man has already decided that he will die, and you only suffer him, will you not be doing him a privilege? Eh? 
A man has come already to die. And then instead of killing him, you beat him. Will it be anything to such a man? I want us to know that first and foremost is a personal decision that we we'll take. But it is not a decision that somebody takes and then when situation comes, a backup. He has parceled himself. He has given to the Lord. And so you see, they will say it. You also judge whether it is correct to obey man or to obey to obey to obey man or to obey God. You also judge. And when they threw that to the people, you know the conclusion was that how oh, it is better to obey God. But you know, they followed it with practical steps. That's, we are talk that's what we are talking about. So when Peter began to say unto Jesus, I want you to note this. What does it mean to give oneself wholly to God? First and foremost, you have made up your, dis your mind and say whatever it is. I will obey God. But on a practical note, how will you yourself know? How will others know? Peter was speaking to Jesus in the midst of the other brethren. And he was giving a testimony of what actually happened. He said, Peter began to say unto him, Lord, we have left all. I say he was talking to Jesus who knew them very well and who knows every one of us. And he said, we have left all and we have followed thee. If they have not left all, the response of Jesus would have pointed out that they have not left all. But I saw that when Jesus responded to what Peter said, it was the Lord Jesus who began to list what actually this man left. Look, if someone has already decided to die for God, to give himself wholly to God, to give everything to God, if his own life is nothing to him, then, is it property? But you know, on a practical note, Jesus began to list for them. It was Jesus who was listing for Peter and the disciples what they actually left. He said, there is no man that have left house. On a practical note, that's what devotion to the Lord means. No man has left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels. That's what they actually left. That God himself did bear them witness. Now, you will agree with, with me that for us this is what comes between us and God. This is what makes men to backslide. These are the things that when God seems to point at in the lives of any one of us oh, it becomes a struggle. It becomes a struggle. When God touches a man's money, when God touches someone's house, landed property, it becomes a matter. But let me tell you for them, as they were coming, it was so natural, so natural, that they just left all. 
And Peter said, we left all and we followed you. And Jesus acknowledged it. Let me point out quickly that as the master was concluding, I saw that that is what we exchange our position. That is what we advance someone or withdraw him. This issue of devotion. The Lord Jesus said, Whatever you left, you will receive it all. Praise the Lord for that. But on this account, many that are first shall be last. And the last shall be first. I saw that the issue of devotion is what advances someone in God's program or what withdraws someone from God's program. So if you are devoted to the Lord, it's not an abstract thing. It's not just thinking about it. It is not just your, your, your responding, and, uh, responding to an altar call and saying, I give all, I surrender all. There are things that actually you will surrender and you will know that God will take over. God will take over. And sincerely speaking, those things become nothing to you because of the surpassing knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We may not be able to look at other examples, but I just wanted us to look at the implication of this in our lives. What does he apply to us today? Because I just want us to look what God expects of even us as we are seated here. And we want you to just read a scripture. Read a scripture in Revelation chapter 6, verse 9 to 11 quickly. And we may be looking at the implication, the expectation of God even upon our lives. And if we get prepared, if we will accept that, look, this expectation of God upon my life is what should hold through when situation demands. I want to tell you, God will have channels, channels to do what He wants to do with our lives. Revelation chapter 6. Let me read quickly verse 9, 10, and 11. What is God expecting of us also? And when he had opened the fifth sea, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they heard. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long? O Lord, holy and true, does thou judge and avenge our blood of them that dwell on the earth? And the Bible says, And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest for a, while, for a little season, until their fellow servants also and their brethren that would be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. What is the implication of this upon our own lives in our time? Sincerely speaking, the kind of gospel that has come to us, many of us have never prepared us for the demand that God is demanding upon our lives. The gospel of prosperity, the gospel whereby men associate receiving Jesus will increase in, 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 in property, will becoming millionaires, will becoming chief executives. God will do all that. 
But I want us to see the equipping in the heart of those who have gone before. The implication of this on our lives, number one, is the expectation that God is expecting even of our generation. Those that have died, that are in heaven, we see what the Bible is saying. That they are worrying God. They are praying to God. They say, God, oh Lord, why are you holding on? How long will you stay before you avenge our blood or those that are on us? Please do quickly. We want to enter into our glory. The Bible says, uh, if so to say, God just took some, some white robes. And if I may put it in this way, to bribe them, to say, just, just hold this. Why was he doing that? What was the expectation of God? The Bible says God was doing that, or God is doing that even now. Let me say it, even now in heaven, there is pressure on God to finish this matter. Those who have gone before us are pressurizing God and saying, God, please, Avenge our blood because you promise us that we will, we will enter glory. And God said, no. Wait for a little season. Do you note the expression, a little season? Are you with me? Do you know that God said, wait for a little season? Please let me announce to you that the time is being rounding up. God didn't promise them a long time. God said, wait for a little season. And see the fellow servants also, and their brethren, that should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. The will of God, I'm putting it very wrong. The will of God for your life, brother, is for you also to be ready to be killed for the gospel as those that have gone before. Theologians have said many things. Our prosperity gospel has said many things. But you see, I see the devil being so very, very clever wanting to beat us to this but I pray that God will produce men that young people that are ready to die for the gospel. I see the devil reading his own young people, the Muslims, very ready to die. So ready to die because he wants to beat us to eat. And I see God saying, Be ready. I am holding up because there are seated here those that should also die for the gospel. I wish that each and every one of us will be equipped in this matter. It's the expectation of God. It's what is discussing with those who have gone before us right now. If your eyes should be open to heaven, that's what God is saying. And if we get ready as it were, to be so devoted to God, that life is no longer an issue. Life is no longer an issue. Those pushing cocaine, life is no longer an issue for them. I imagine that they have put all the gadgets at the international airport to track down cocaine pushers. And every day you are reading that people are being caught with cocaine. I say, God, what kind of thing is this? 
And now there are regions everywhere in the world that are threatening that you, if a Christian comes there, we are going to kill him. Very recently you heard how there was a text message going on our phones that 22 Christians were to be slaughtered in Afghanistan. Did you get that text? I know that when you read it, all that you are doing is to bind, bind Afghanistan government, isn't it? God is expecting more. If it is Muslims, as they are killing those ones, do you know others will rush to go there and die? Do you agree with me? If God equip our hearts, if God succeed with this level of devotion to Him in our own heart, there shall be nothing that will stop the gospel any longer. Not little sufferings, not little inconveniences, not little anything. I saw how one young man, he came from Lagos, and he was quarreling the brethren in the kitchen. The sister that has the kitchen, she said she just, she just folded her hands and was, uh, and, was, and was just listening to this young man. He was raking. Food had finished. We, the food that we have done for Millet students had finished. And these young people, this young man, he didn't send us word that he was coming. On the Tuesday he came. But when he came and he discovered that food had finished, he was making and saying how he has left his family in the morning and how he has traveled all this way and how he was, he was raking. And I said, what, what is it? He was lucky that I was not there that time. I only came to hear it. Are you getting me? I would have asked him to take another vehicle back to Lagos. If... If one little convenience, little inconvenience, you didn't send for us to prepare food for you that time, and you are coming and shouting at everybody that it is your own right to eat, right to do this. Yes, that's our own Christianity, right to ourselves. And we hold it and we swing on it and we do everything. But I want us to know that the devotion that God required of us is that a devotion to Him that we are ready, ready to die. I wish we will pray today and ask God to baptize us with such a heart. And except we are ready with such a heart, the Bible says those that are are first will become last. And those that are last, they will become first. There is a readiness that God must ready us to go to any extent for his own sake. Peter said, we left all. We left all. Are you willing to leave all? Are you willing to pray to the Lord today and say, Father, even if it means death, if that is the prayer, we will pray and say, God, baptize me with the readiness to go to any extent with you, even if it means losing my own life. That's what the devil is producing in the world. And the cause of the devil is growing very fast. Jesus is looking for an army. Jesus is sitting down and counting those that are coming to him, whether he will meet the devil with an army in his hand that is stronger than the enemies. If he gets few, his own situation is not number. His own desire is not number. Even if he has few, the Bible says he will launch into an attack. Meanwhile, he seems to be begging the situation. 
But are there young people, are there men here today who are saying, Oh, so Father, that's your expectation for my life? You will be more blessed in your own heart if you have me. Instead of claiming millions, I am claiming death for you if need be. That's what God is saying to us today. And I know we go, can't go beyond here because of our time. But I will want us to respond to this. I will want us to respond to this this morning. Have you seen the expectation of God over our lives? The implication of devotion and what it is for, for our own lives. Will you bow to the Lord and say, Father, if this be what you are expecting of me, then help my heart. Walk on me. I have no need to live if not living for you. Can we pray together? Can we pray together? Can you arise as we talk to the Lord on this? I want you to talk to him. I want you to take time and think a little, then respond to the Lord. God is saying to those who have gone before us that they are, they are, they are fellow servants whom he is waiting but for a little season now that they also should read their lives, should be keyed as they are. For him to avenge this world of their blood. For him to round up his own program. For him to come. A little season. Are you praying to the Lord today that, Father, I am ready to be that fellow servant? I am ready. Or do you feel? It's a commitment that you cannot make. Let me tell you what we advance you in the purpose of God is the equipping of the heart in this way, but much more the practical readiness to act it out. Can you talk to the Lord very briefly today? I am ready not only to suffer, but to die. For the Lord, for Jesus' name in Jerusalem. That's what they said. That was the preparation of their own heart. That was their devotions. Talk to the Lord today. Lift up your hand to him and lift up your mouth and your voice to him and say, Father, if this be so, help my own life. Anything that we cast fear, the Lord said we should not be afraid. We should not be afraid. I want to tell you these people, they finish with the fear of death. Even for the Lord. That the extent they went. Can you talk to him today? Say, Lord, so that's your expectation of my life? That's what you are saying? Help my own life also. I must be that fellow servant. That's the fellowship in, in service. That God is expecting us to have with those who have gone before us. That's the fellowship in service. In Jesus' name we pray. If that is what you have said to the Lord, 
You will still lift up your hands as you lifted them as you were praying. And we just commit ourselves to the Lord. If that was the decisions you are taking today, as you are seeing the expectation of God, this, the devotion that these people gave to the Lord, and what implication it is for our own life also. We will just commit ourselves to the Lord. Our Father, we thank you. We thank you that you are opening your heart as you are lifting up the examples of disciples that went before us. As you are pointing out what you saw in them and what came forth from their own lives that made you flow unhindered in their own midst. In their own generation. Oh blessed Savior. We want to ask thank you that you want us to be fellows in service with them. To experience the same. Lord we pray this morning that we will not just pray and leave service to this. We ask that, O oh Lord, in our midst also, Father, you work out a work. You will do something in our lives. You will change our hearts. You will change our attitude. Because, Lord, we are seeing that that is the understanding that is in your own heart. Let this understanding sink, sink deep in our lives in the name of Jesus. When you would have raised us to the point where we are ready to die for you, what threat again will the devil threaten us? What will property again be a threat to us? Father, we ask that you do a deep work in our lives in the name of Jesus. Equip us with the heart that will equip those men. So that, O oh Lord, whatever devotion men are doing outside there, it will not attract you because you would have had a devotion in the house. Oh, thank you, blessed Savior. Look upon these hands that are lifted to you everywhere. Look at their hearts, O oh God, and we pray that you will baptize us with the Spirit that is not stoppable again for by anything and for anything. Cause us to move, cause us to go, cause us, O oh God, to be yielded completely in life or death to you in the name of Jesus. Thank you, blessed Savior. We know you will do it, you will help us, you will make us agents of transformation. We will not mind anything again. Where you shoot us, we will go. No obstacle will stop us. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, blessed Savior. For in Jesus' name we are prayed. Amen. Amen.